is Wai Ping Sun, Rice University representative and of counsel at the law firm of Yeta Coleman. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar, Overcoming Challenges of COVID-19 and Evolving Opportunities in the Post-Pandemic Era. Since last December, worldwide, there have been 6.6 .6 million people diagnosed with COVID-19. Nearly 400,000 people have died of this disease. This is a global problem which requires a global solution and international collaboration. Only by working together can we find the solution to this pandemic quickly. That's why today we have assembled experts from Canada, China, Singapore, and the United States to exchange ideas and share the best practices. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Wu Xifeng for suggesting joining forces to have this webinar. Rice University is honored to be a co-organizer with Zhejiang University. Thanks should also go to all the participants and the co-sponsors. Thank you for your dedication and for your thorough preparation for today's webinar. I promise you this will be an information-packed and thought-provoking session. Now, first, let's welcome the longtime advocate for promoting U.S.-China relations, Mr. Neil Bush, founder and chairman of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations to give the formal official welcome remarks. Mr. Bush, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ping, very much. Uh, what, a, what an honor it is to participate with such a distinguished group of panelists. Uh, my father believed that the U.S.-China relationship was uh, the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Um, not only is our country right now, our world facing um, the health challenges of a pandemic and the, uh, the, the global challenges of, of the economy, uh, global economy being shut down, but we're also seeing a rise in tensions between two great countries, the United States and China. Um, and if there was ever a time in the world that we should pursue the ethos and the philosophy of George H.W. Bush, um, where we should collaborate, where we should share best practices, that time is now. Uh, with the pandemic spreading globally, we can learn from one another. We can learn the best mitigation strategies. We can learn the best um, you know, recovery strategies. The economies open up, we should figure out together what is the best strategy for opening up safely and wisely, but to get our economies going again. Uh, we should be collaborating and finding vaccines. We should be collaborating and finding you know, uh, drugs that, that help to remediate those that have COVID-19 and other and future uh, um, viruses. Uh, we should be collaborating to find testing, the appropriate testing. This is, this is a time when we should find our common humanity, link arms, and, and work together. So to build walls, to point fingers of blame, you know, th these are counterproductive and not, not appropriate. So I'm very proud that the George H.W. Bush Foundation for uh, U.S.-China Relations is, spon is sponsoring, co-sponsoring this. Very proud of the amazing assembly of experts here, including my old friend, Chi Feng Wu, who sadly has left Houston, but she's doing great things in China these days, and, um, and excited to be listening in. I'm not, I can't claim to be an expert in anything, but I do know that these kinds of deliberations are really critical, critical to the world and critical to our, our, our you know, to humankind. So I wanna thank all of you for tuning in, and I wanna thank each panelist uh, experts from all over the United States, from Singapore, Canada, and China for participating. 
thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Bush, for the wonderful welcome remarks. Our thank first you. speaker is Dr. Stan H. Vermont, Dean and Anna M. R. Lauder Professor of Public Health at Yale University. Dr. Vermont, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, a great a privilege to join this Zhejiang University, Rice University Joint Initiative. And uh, I want to remind people that uh, there are a number of uh, Neil's relatives who went to Yale. So we're, <laughs> including his dad. Um, we, um, we'll get the slides up in a moment, so I guess I'll start talking without them. Uh, the first slide you're going to see is the, um, let's go to the next slide and let's make the slides to the maximum if we can float, that's perfect, thank you. So just a quick reminder about SARS and MERS. You may recall that we knew about coronaviruses as uh, a cause of uh, cold symptoms. Let's go back a slide. Um, uh, as a cause of cold symptoms are four identified coronaviruses that were uh, in children and adults, and they caused the common cold. And there were a number of virologists around the world studying them because they were very interesting. But then in 2003 came SARS, and it caused 8,000 cases and 800 deaths around the world, so a 10% mortality rate. So it was really quite lethal. But fortunately, it wasn't as infectious as influenza, and it kind of died out in the summer of 2004. Um, and, uh, but not after it had caused billions, tens of millions of dollars of, um, of economic damage to um, uh, Guangdong province, to uh, Hong Kong, to Toronto, and elsewhere. Uh, fast forward to 2012, and another novel coronavirus emerged. We had never seen it before in humans, and that was in the Middle East, in the Arabian Peninsula. And it was even more lethal. Uh, between 30 and 40 percent uh, of patients died, but it wasn't very infectious. So we've only had about 2,500 cases. There was one uh, outbreak of a South Korean businessman who went uh, back home and about 20 cases in South Korea as a consequence of introducing the virus. Um, so we've had a lot of warning. Next slide, please. And um, that warning includes influenza. So uh, the fact that um, pandemic respiratory viruses are a risk for the globe is old news. We all remember the 1918-1919 influenza. It's called the Spanish influenza because Spain was not part of World War I and they didn't have censorship of their newspapers. That's the only reason it's called the Spanish influenza. It was first reported in Spain. Uh, it's, uh, th these are types of zoonotic influenzas. Uh, they uh, can emerge from uh, pigs. They can emerge from um, birds. And uh, we always are under the threat of a pandemic influenza strain. Um, and with pandemic flu having recurred in 1957, in 1968, in 2009, there were books like The Coming Plague. Um, I think that was written in 1994, predicting a global pandemic of a respiratory virus. Betrayal of Trust that came the next year by the same journalist, Lori Garrett. Um, describing the deterioration of the global uh, public health infrastructure. And then as recently as just a couple of years ago, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention updated its pandemic influenza plan, including community mitigation strategies. And what did they recommend? It? They recommended uh, having mass production of uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, they recommended um, stockpiling uh, ventilators. They recommended uh, expanding capacity for hospitals in the case of a serious pandemic. Now, I happened to visit um, an infectious disease hospital that was brand new, built after SARS, uh, outside of Shanghai. And I saw this big open field. And I said, well, is that open field used for anything? Is it sports or what? They said, no, that's our tent hospital. And they showed me the little, uh, the little tubes in the ground that had been buried. And they could, in six hours, 
transport all the tents that were in nearby storage, set them up and hook up oxygen, um, electricity, water, um, uh, and, uh, and sewage to each and every tent. They could, ex they could expand the capacity of their hospital by about threefold. So that Chinese learned from their lesson uh, at the time of SARS, and they had tremendous surge capacity. They, as, as you all remember, Wuhan built a hospital in about two weeks. That's because it had already been planned. That's because it had already been uh, 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 thoroughly uh, anticipated. So um, they were prepared. And the US, unfortunately, was not prepared. Next slide, please. Now, this is the update from this morning. There are 6.6 .6 million cases uh, compared to less than a million uh, uh, just um, uh, two months ago. Um, and then uh, we've had uh, almost 400,000 deaths. It'll be beyond 400,000 uh, sometime uh, next week for um, uh, the, the proportion of diagnosed people who die are about 6%. And that hasn't changed too much. And the United States, sadly, is the epicenter of the global pandemic uh, with nearly 2 million cases and over 100,000 deaths. Um, next comes Brazil. And Brazil wasn't even the top 10 three weeks ago, but they have surged. And uh, the US and Brazil have something in common, which is that their leaders have been very skeptical about the importance of this condition. Our president and the president of Brazil share that in common. Uh, Russia is number three, Spain, United Kingdom, Italy, and India has been surging. But of course, they have a vast population of nearly 1.4 billion people. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see the next highest cases, Germany, Peru, Turkey, Iran, France, Chile, Mexico, Canada, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, China, and Qatar, uh, and the, the range. So you can see that the list of the top uh, 20 countries now is really quite different from what it was a month ago, showing how quickly um, patterns can change. Take a look at China. So China had the worst epidemic in the world for three months, two months anyway, two and a half months. And because they shut it down, the rest of the world has surged past. And there are very few new cases in China, as all of you know. Next slide. Now, what um, seems to have worked, I'm sorry, I, I, I lost the, the words at the top. What seems to have worked? Well, surveillance and rapid response, including testing and lockdown. Very successful in South Korea, very successful in New Zealand, successful in China when they got their act together after a couple of months and, and things really started humming in terms of the response. Um, when we can do more point of care viral and antibody testing, and uh, we can uh, improve our contact tracing capacities. That's been enormously helpful. The, I mentioned a minute ago surge capacity for staff and beds, stockpiling needed equipment and supplies, task shifting, getting our community health workers to participate, um, uh, healthcare facility expansion, um, uh, converting uh, rooms to negative pressure rooms, which it can be done by clever building engineers. Um, decompression of institutionalized populations. Try to see if people from nursing homes can go back home or go into um, hotels if they can care for themselves, uh, dormitories, homeless shelters, prisons. See if you can decompress these highly concentrated areas. And then, of course, the theme of social responsibility and discipline, uh, complemented by structural interventions wearing masks, ventilation of the indoors, activities out, outdoors, physical distancing, staying in residence, limiting group size and travel, hand and face hygiene, cleansing of surfaces, and then tricks like one-way stairwells, single lane pedestrian traffic, and considerations for public uh, transportation. Next slide. Now, uh, what is not uh, uh, yet up and running and part of the theme of today's conversation is global partnerships in science and development. So antiviral uh, drug development uh, is um, uh, making progress. We have uh, uh, over 500 clinical trials that are ongoing at the present time, and also immunomodulating agents treat, treating the cytokine storm 
as it's sometimes called, with biologics and immunosuppressive drugs. Um, vaccine development that av avoids immune enhancement, avoids exorbitant costs, uh, expanded testing capacity. It would be fabulous if saliva testing could be improved to be more um, affordable and practical. Also, batch testing could be helpful, where you where you uh, combine uh, tests of individuals, particularly in low prevalence areas. And then data sciences that have so much to offer us for uh, modernizing our evaluation of travelers, contact tracing, surveillance, and mathematical forecasting. And then finally, policy, culture, prosperity. We have to have honesty in government and healthcare. Rapid information sharing is vital. We have to reestablish healthcare services because many people have not been able to get their healthcare during this COVID. Um, and then we have to never again um, neglect our, our public health infrastructures. We have to be ready for the next pandemic. And we're all in the process of thoughtful reopening and economic recovery. Next slide. Thank you very much. Oh, Ping, we are not hearing you. Thank you, Dr. Vermont. Our My next pleasure. speaker is Dr. Wu Xifeng. Dean of School of Public Health, Vice President of the Second Affiliated Hospital, Zhejiang University. Dr. Wu, please. Okay, Lava. Good morning and good evening, everyone. I'm Shifeng from Zhejiang University School of Public Health. My topic today is from local to global, the spread of coronavirus and control strategies in China. In my presentation, first I will take a little bit about, talk a little bit about the local experience from China. And the first three items are results from three studies from my team. And these studies mainly focus on the epidemiological trends and the control strategies and the measures. Then, based on this experience, the fourth item I will briefly introduce what the other countries can learn from this uh, Chinese local experience. Before talking about the individual studies, I will quickly go through as a school of public health what we have done during the pandemic. We did multiple tasks in terms of research to estimate the epidemiology trends and predict the number of cases by using models. We provided policy advisory to the governments for policy making by evaluating when and how to restart the economy and reopen schools. We developed the public health education and promotion platform for students and the public. The first study we conducted the multiple transmission models to predict the epidemiology trends and the potential cases at national, pro, provincial, city, and the county level. For example, considering control strategies and measures, we predict that the infected cases across China, except the Hubei province, could reach to 11,500 to 14,500, and actually the official reported cases was 13,946, which was quite close. And then we predicted the cases in Zhejiang province, the cities of Hangzhou and Wenzhou, and the county of Yuqing were also very close to the official reported numbers. And this predicted the epidemiology trends and the potential cases played important roles in decision-making in the local levels. In addition, at the early stage, as we know little about the disease and have shortage in medical supplies, one of the key issues is to make precisely short-term prediction on daily number of cumulative cases. We use the recalibrated 
time series models to make the short-term prediction. We found that the ERMA model with a five-day prediction time span as the optimal choice. The second study, due to the lack or delay of testing, case data during the early stage epidemic may be incomplete. Thus, the estimation of the actual infections in Wuhan is important in the investigation of the impacts of Wuhan lockdown. Here, based on population movement data from Wuhan to 217 other cities in China, we estimated the actual daily new infection rate in Wuhan during the early stage epidemic. And we found that if the Wuhan lockdown was delayed by seven days, that is, if it's delayed to January 30, the cumulative number of confirmed cases by March 17th in mainland China, excluding Wuhan, could be 3.3 to 3.9 times higher. And this data confirms that Wuhan lockdown is a very important decision at that time. The third study is about control strategies and measures in Chinese cities. You know, cities in China have taken multifaceted measures to control the COVID-19 outbreak since January 2020. Hence, it is crucial to evaluate the efficacy of such control strategies and measures in elevating the epidemic retrospectively. We performed time series cluster to identify different epidemic patterns at the city level. Then we evaluated 12 indicators of 50 cities with the most number of infected cases, including 66 control measure indicators, three population flu indicators, and three socioeconomic factors. Cluster analysis for 51 selected cities was grouped into four clusters, and most of the cities were grouped into clusters three in blue and four in yellow with mild epidemic trends. Then we evaluate the control strategies and the measure for each city among the four clusters. And this figure shows the scores of each city for cluster four. We found the highest score in the emergency preparedness was Hangzhou, which initiated the highest level public health responses even before any confirmed COVID-19 cases were reported on January 18. And then we also found the highest total score after the combination of all the 12 indicators is Beijing. And we found that both cities did good jobs in controlling the spread of the virus. Above, we discussed about the epidemiology trends and outbreak of COVID-19 and the control strategies and measures in China. And based on these studies, how countries can prevent and rebound from an epidemic like COVID-19. <laughs> And we tried to answer these questions very early when the WHO declared that COVID-19 is a pandemic. And this piece of work was published on the World Economic Forum. And in this paper, we summarized six lessons. First, speed and accuracy are the keys to identification and detection. And second, make the right decisions at the right time, the right place for the right people. For example, the Wuhan uh, lockdown. Third, big data and information technology are important to avoiding a rebound. Fourth, evaluate medical resources and response system. And fifth, implementation of preventive measures in communities, schools, business, government office, and the homes can influence the trajectory of this epidemic. Six, keep the public well informed. 
Hence, the World Economic Forum recommended that national and local governments around the world can learn from China's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Our next speaker is Dr. Tu Ying, Dean of Seoul Seahawk School of Public Health, National University of Singapore. Dr. Tu, please. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank the previous two speakers, Dan Vermon, uh, Dean Vermont, as well as Dean Wu for describing the situation both globally and locally. And what I would do in the next five to six minutes is actually give a really quick uh, description of what happened in Singapore. Next slide, please. And, oh, sorry, next slide, please. I thought I would start off by talking about the current case numbers. So yesterday, the numbers went up by about another 500 in Singapore. So the total case counts in Singapore is the, about 36,000. But I think what I want to highlight is that if you focus on the actual active cases right now, there are around 13,000 active cases, but of which only five are in intensive care units and only about 300 or so are in the hospitals. The vast majority of them are actually isolated in government facilities. They are not sent back home these are people that are confirmed to be uh, infected with the coronavirus, but they are actually maintained within a government facility. They, they are kept in isolation. And I think this is something that I'm going to talk about later on in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Because I, I see this as very important as countries worldwide decide on what are their, what are their precautions and strategies in terms of containing COVID-19 in their countries. Now, this slide actually shows what is the current situation? And you could see in the top panel, the total number really remained very low. Those are the total number of daily case counts, very low up until sometime in April. And that coincided with a rise in the, the migrant workers living in dormitories. So Singapore, we actually have two fronts that we are fighting at the moment. The first front is what is happening in the general community and this is what we typically term as community transmission created by people who are moving about in the public, taking public transportation, going to workplaces, perhaps going to schools and so on. But there is a second front and that is the migrant workers in Singapore. They live in uh, purpose-built dormitories and the, the human density in that dormitory is actually pretty high. And once a, a coronavirus that is so infectious enters a, uh, a human compound where there is high human density living in, in that compound, the spread becomes very quick. And we saw that in April. And within a matter of weeks, Singapore's reputation of containing COVID-19 turned from what was turned, uh, deemed as a gold standard to became a cautionary tale. And I, I like to focus on this bit as a cautionary tale because Singapore is undergoing significant amount of pain and stress because of the situation in the dormitories. And I often highlight that this is a lesson also to the rest of the world because in many other countries, in your country, in my country, we have communities that are very similar to migrant worker dormitories. And these are the communities that could will be much more vulnerable to an infectious disease like the coronavirus. So we have to look very transparently at our own country's situation and identify which are the elements, the, the environments, the surroundings that will be susceptible to such spread. And Dean Vermont earlier on talked about nursing homes, talk about potentially prisons, talk about uh, there are slum communities, and those are the, the same community that has the, the similar propensity for a very significant spread. That once it catches on, it takes a lot of effort, both community effort and government effort to bring it under control. So these are the two fronts that Singapore are fighting. Next slide, please. 
And you can see that based on those two fronts, we have actually put in place a lockdown of sorts. We call it a circuit breaker. But that ended this Monday, and we are very happy that uh, there is some degree of easing. The easing of this measures have happened in phases. So for example, schools are now allowed to resume partially. So half the school are returning while it takes turn. This week, half the school returns. Next week, the other half. Workplaces that were closed continue the strong call to telecommute to work from home. And this is really based on very simple principles. We know what causes the spread and that's human to human interactions. Social distancing, safe distancing are the recommendations to minimize community transmission. Next slide, please. So Singapore's key approach towards containing COVID-19 can be summarized very quickly in three key principles. And I will talk about the principles in turn. Next slide, please. The first is really very aggressive testing, very rapid isolation of people who have been exposed through contact tracing. And we saw the effectiveness of this contact tracing where in the early days, as early in February, we saw that it takes on average about 10 to 15 days to identify someone who has been infected and then to isolate all their, their respective contacts. But this time reduced significantly to about four to five days uh, in the past one month. And this means that we are able to find people who have been exposed, we isolate them, we monitor them, and we aggressively test them. So the moment they turn positive, they have very little chance of interacting with others in public. And this is part of the reason why the World Health Organization constantly remind governments to put in place aggressive testing tactics, strategies, as well as contact tracing capability. Next slide, please. The second approach that Singapore adopted was really reliance on evidence. And, and Dean Wu also mentioned that China did this. We looked at epidemiological models to guide Singapore's response, whether we should close schools, whether we should close workplaces, whether we should shut down specific transportation hub. Next slide, please. Every action that the government take actually were the advice from teams of experts. They are medical experts, infectious disease experts, social science experts, economic experts. And one of the things that we were very happy that an institution like the School of Public Health can contribute to government response was to very quickly synthesize evidence from around the world, summarize this in policy briefs. So the government, even as early as January and February, while many governments are struggling to learn about the disease, the Singapore government actually had a platform of relying on policy briefs and uh, scientific briefs from scientists. And this is actually a website that is flashed on the screen. The website remains active. Every of these reports are updated weekly, which means that if you download the, the report today about vaccine, you learn about what are the latest development that has happened in the past week as well around vaccine development and vaccine trials in the rest of the world. So please use this resource if it, you find it useful. Next slide, please. And the third is really around medical care. We know for a fact that the coronavirus actually uh, has very mild impact on the vast majority of people. So this is the reason why we have very low mortality rates because we preserve our precious hospital resources for those in the high risk, those that are suffering from severe conditions. But the, the vast majority with very mild symptoms, they are not sent back home, but they are decanted to isolation facilities so they can recover and over a period of two to three weeks. The next slide, please. And the, the last principle that uh, Dean Vermont mentioned is really around the importance of communications. And in, in countries like China, Singapore, New Zealand, we have seen the value of effective and, and regulated communications that are transparent and frank, uh, because in Singapore, we share three kinds of information with the public. The first is what is the current situation in Singapore? Is it good? Is it bad? What are the numbers? Where are the people that are infected? Where, where have they been? 
The second is really around regulations. There are new laws and new rules that are being put in place because this is a very rapidly evolving situation. The people need to have a, a platform that they can learn about the new rules. And lastly, this is about people. What are the actions that people like you and me can take such that we minimize our own risk and we minimize risk to others in the community? Next slide, please. This is uh, pretty much my last slide. Uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. This is pretty much my last slide that I'll talk about, which is really around global public health. Because when we start to talk in this platform, there are many experiences from different countries. There will be commonalities that we hear, but equally important is that there are major differences. There are significant differences that rely on the context. And we have to interpret our own context very well. There are five contexts that I can talk about historical, Countries like China, Singapore, Vietnam, South Korea, we had our learning experiences through SARS, through MERS, through H1N1. And that has helped the country prepare very well, not just government facilities, but also community response. The next is also around social and cultural. Trust. In, in Asia's culture and society, the, the I like to think that the population tends to be more community spirited. There is greater degree of trust between people and perhaps also with the government. And that has, in my opinion, helped a lot when government has to put in place very difficult measures, especially when it comes to lockdowns. The, last is, uh, the, the, the next point is around capacity and capability. And this, I have to highlight capacity and capability are very different. One is the capability to do things, and the next is actually whether you have the capacity to expand, to extend it to a nationwide measure, uh, implementation. The fourth is economic. I think that's very clear. I wouldn't belabor it, but I will just touch on the last point, the political aspect, because what we have seen worldwide is that countries where there are governments that are more self-assured and stable in the past, they would have put in place the necessary investment to prepare countries for public health crisis. It could be an infectious, crisis, infectious disease crisis. It could be a chronic disease crisis like diabetes. All of this requires long-term investment in public health. But countries where the, you have very rapid turnover, turnover for government, that's where you see perhaps some of these governments are very interested in short-term impacts that they put in place measures that looks very popular and very visible in the short term, but that's where public health tends to be deprioritized. And we see from a crisis like COVID-19 that investment in public health is very important. So with that, I would like to end my presentation uh, with the last slide, which is just a very quick summary. And I, I like, uh, next slide please. And I'd like to uh, perhaps also emphasize that when we start to think about the global response. It is important that this global response take into account of inter-government partnership, especially when we start to think about unlocking, easing these measures. There are green lanes, they are talking about air bridges for countries to resume trade and travel. A lot of this requires transparency and trust between governments. With that, I thank you and I pass it back to Ping, please. Thank you, Dr. Tu. Our next speaker is Dr. Lynn R. Goldman, Michael and Laurie Milken, Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health, George Washington University. Please, Dr. Goldman. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to uh, be here with uh, some of my uh, friends, uh, Stan Vermond and, and Zifang Wu, and I guess newer friends, Dr. Tao, it was a pleasure to hear your talk. If you could um, put up my first slide, please. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking to you about how the epidemic is um, in Washington, DC, and especially as we're planning uh, to uh, move into the next phases, but also preparing, uh, frankly, for, for more transmission of the virus. Next slide. So, uh, next slide. Um, I also promised that I talk a little bit about the vaccine. So as you know, we've been flattening the curve, but then how do we continue to do that as we're starting to reopen our economy? And next slide. So 
the recent systematic review, and I just have the reference here, I found it in the literature today, I think it was recently published, next slide, it does provide some encouragement in terms of the fact that um, it, for coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19, that there is very strong evidence that physical distancing of at least a meter is, is beneficial. Um, even one meter of distancing has an adjusted odds ratio of 0.18, or a risk differential of minus 10%. And you get more protection with each additional meter. You can double that with another meter. And face mask use, and they were talking about either N95s or disposable surgical masks, not the little cloth masks that we're using right now, had a similar impact in terms of reducing the risk of infection. And this is across many countries uh, globally. And interestingly, often, and we have not been employing this, but eye protection also it seems to have a strong um, association with less infection, albeit with lower certainty because there were fewer publications. And of course, there could be publication bias in these kinds of studies, but still it provides evidence that helps us deal with our policymakers. Next slide. So we don't know it at all in the United States what's going on because um, unlike many other countries, we have to see symptoms before we're allowing uh, the tests to be used. And this is a slide that um, a, a scientist um, in the UK made, but I think it's very apt, which is that when, when we're looking at our test results, we see the tip of the iceberg. And unfortunately in the United States, the tip of the iceberg is a very small fraction of the iceberg because you have to be pretty sick, or hospitalized to be tested. And so people mildly or moderately symptomatic or not symptomatic at all, we know very little about those rates. Whereas in Germany, where there was a lot of testing, um, and, and you, you, did, you, you had more of the, the cases disclosed, which provides a, an apparent difference in the case fatality ratio. And I think this is very important because um, our data are quite um, uneven and inconsistent because of the way we have implemented testing. Next slide. And we're taking a risk-based approach. The, the governors of the states, including DC, which is not a state, but considered to be a state anyway, and I, I'm not gonna explain that, but that is just the way it is in our country. They are taking an approach that says that we, we wanna be risk-based in how we are reopening. And by risk, they're talking about a function of transmission of the virus and consequences. And we heard already a lot about how we can prevent transmission but also we can reduce the consequences by, um, as was pointed out already, isolating cases, doing a better job with treatment as well. Next slide. So we also have a framework that the governors are using um, that um, I used to teach when I taught environmental health, a hierarchy of controls where much more preferable are controls like physical distancing and engineering, and unfortunately, the least preferable are controls like PPE. And we're already seeing in our country in some of our states as they reopen that actually people are refusing to use PPE. And they, in, in, in Austin, Texas, for example, as soon as the movie theaters were open and they were told to use PPE, that people rebelled and refused to do that. And so, that is not a reliable way of, of providing protection in a society like ours, where people are very, um, very independent and want to be self-sufficient. Next slide. And we do have, as already been mentioned, the specific populations that have really amplified the epidemic or had most severe impacts. And all of these have already been mentioned, except for the last one, certain occupations, healthcare, but also in the United States, people who are working in meat packing and warehouses, other occupations considered to be essential, where they were working through the pandemic, were not able to stay at home and did not have enough protection. Next slide. So DC, and I've served on the task force to the mayor of, the, of, of DC, has decided to take a four stage approach in reopening. We just on Friday moved to stage number one, where we can have gatherings of up to 10 people 
but it's still a public health emergency. People are still being asked to wear masks and most businesses are not open yet, but some are starting to. When we move to stage two, our campus will reopen. There will be school gatherings of up to 50 people. And then stage three, uh, 250 people. Stage four, we don't reach that till we have a vaccine. This is different than the federal process. So this is something that's strange about the United States, but state by state, different processes are being created. But our mayor is very careful about how she's implementing this, making sure we have adequate medical surge capacity and increasing contact tracing and testing, but we're still not testing asymptomatic people. We're not testing all of the contacts of people who are known to be, have the disease. Next slide. General safeguards are being taken as well. I'm not gonna read all of these to you. You've heard about all of this, and, but these are all requirements that are, are on the citizens of Washington, D.C., including even the first citizen, the President of the United States, who happens to live here in a place called the White House. Next slide. So I, I promised to talk about how we're approaching uh, trying to, um, to innovate around this, and there are some innovations that are happening in treatment and prevention. In treatment, uh, in particular, We've been interested in um, antivirals medications that are being developed like remdesivir, which had been tried and didn't work very well for Ebola, but seems to have a positive impact on COVID-19, particularly in animal model models and cell cultures and beginning to show impacts in clinical trials. And so we have hopes that higher doses and also inhalation doses of that antiviral and similar ones are gonna help, as well as antibodies. And there is a push across our country for people who are, have recovered to donate blood to, uh, to accumulate donor antibodies that can be given to people who are ill and also to produce monoclonal antibodies that can be used um, um, possibly someday for prevention, but right now it's being developed for treatment. And the antibodies, of course, have to be delivered in a way that's very careful. If they're delivered early in an infection, they can be quite effective. If they're delivered late in an infection, they can actually have um, bad effects, um, contradictory effects that are quite dangerous to the patients. In terms of prevention, um, in the United States, virus testing is still very limited. We're trying to do more of it on asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic people in Washington. And we're told by the FDA that we may not until we get an EUA for that. We have to get special regulatory approval to test people who don't have symptoms. Um, antibody testing, which our, our public health laboratories believe and I believe will be useful for public health. We need to have seroprevalence studies so that we can understand what actually has happened because up to now, our case ascertainment has been so poor, we have no idea in most of our communities how many people have had this virus. Contact tracing, we're building contact tracing workforces. My university has worked with the state and local health officers to actually provide a tool that they can use for estimating what the workforce they need for contact tracing. And the state health officers have developed a free training that they provide up to anybody who needs it. Next slide. And there is an effort, I'm about done, um, to develop a vaccine and I've um, called Operation Warp Speed that our White House and our National Institutes of Health are leading. As well as I, I wanted to point out to you a web page by the Milken Institute, not to be confused with the Milken Institute School, but their organization, Faster Cures, has a tracker for all the drugs and vaccines that are in development everywhere in the world. And it's a very useful tool. You can look them up and understand who's developing, where they are in the process, what the molecules are and so forth. And next slide. So these are the vaccines that Operation Warp Speed is investing in. So the United States government is putting a fair amount of money into this. Starting this summer, they're going to begin to launch some massive clinical trials. 
I think they're, they're talking about recruiting 30,000 people for each trial. For those of these that proceed to that stage, they won't all make it to that stage. That could be up to 150,000 people in clinical trials if they all make it to that stage. And it's, it's basically, you know, two of them are mRNA vaccines. There aren't any mRNA vaccines on the market now. So this is a very new approach um, relative to at least what's available commercially. Two of them are non-replicating adenovirus vectors that are being used as a vaccine. And another one is an engineered virus vector that does replicate. So there are basically three kinds of technologies, five vaccines that um, are being heavily supported by our government. And next slide. So that's it, that's just ready for uh, discussion when we are ready to move to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Our next speaker is Dr. Wang Jianan, president of the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University. Please, Dr. Wang. Okay, please allow me to share my slides with you. Still prohibited to sharing the... So moderator, please uh, allow me to share my screen with you. So organizer, please allow me to share my slides with you. Okay, good. Okay, uh, a lot of distinguished friends. Uh, good, good evening and good morning. It is my great honor to share with you my, my presentation, which the title is uh, Key Elements of Hospital Management During COVID-19 Pandemic. Okay, um, first, uh, I think the to hospital and management, uh, it is very important to set up the task forces quickly in response to the outbreak of pandemic. In my hospital, we set up the COVID-19 prevention and the control steering committee. Uh, I'm the chairman of the committee. So under the committee, uh, there's a very strong uh, we call the prevention and the control working uh, working committee. So under the working committee, there are eight functional teams. The next one, please. Next slide, please. And then uh, second uh, second one is to build a staff pipeline. Uh, during the pandemic period, the infection disease department are uh, short of hands. In our hospital, there are less than possibly just uh, 10 to 12 physicians. Then we need to gather other doctors from our department to help them. So hospital, we build a staff pipeline, uh, preferably doctors from internal medicine related specialties, and some even from the surgeon department. Uh, looks so important, training, training those staffs. We, we, we would like to make sure they uh, correctly wear the PPE. They understand how to donning and how to dwarfing the PPEs. We keep them, uh, we keep updates on knowledge of the COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> all of those staff, they work to, uh, they work in the fever clinic uh, or isolation ward or sampling station. Uh, hospital don't want don't want keep those stuff to to be fatigued. Uh, we change it. initially we keep them for uh, eight hours each shift. Later on we change our policy. We let them to work for four hours. So each shift four hours for each shift. Uh, so make sure they have a uh, plenty of time to to be rest. Um, so all of those stuff ab about two hundred stuff. Be controlled by the be controlled and managed by the infection disease department. And next one, please. Uh, the third one is the uh, staff management. Until now, we still emphasize that every staff in our hospital need to report their daily healthy status. Uh, most of our staff use the mobile to report their. Uh, healthy situation. 
but some they uh, they don't like to use the mobile. They fill the form. Uh, and until now, we still insist on the policy. Uh, <clears throat> every staff uh, still need to report their travel history in the last two weeks, uh, especially those staff when they come back from the epicenter, they need to be quarantined at home for at least 14, 14 days. Uh, since the two months ago, almost two months ago, uh, the government emphasized that all of staff in our hospital, the all of staff, medical staff, uh, received the test, uh, including the PCRI plus the antibody. So now we, all of our staff have the test. And next word, please. Thank you. Uh, the PPE strategy and the policy is also very important. Uh, our hospital COVID-19 working committee, they set up the strategies and policies. Uh, keeps update the policy based on the following factors. The first one is the risk of exposure. Uh, in different uh, working place, may, they may have a different uh, risk of exposure. Uh, depending on the severity of the epidemics at that time, uh, depending on the characteristics of patients, uh, depending on the availability of resources. Uh, also, they we following the national guidelines. Next one, please. Uh, also, uh, looks very important is uh, we call the space management of space control. So every buildings with hospital set up way in and uh, from way out. Uh, in the way in, we check temperature and uh, has a code uh, at, the, at the entrance of each building, screen everyone. And hospital spend, uh, we, we facilitate the fever clinic. Uh, we, we set up the pharmacy lab test uh, in fever clinic. We set up the dedicated CT ex examination room, uh, which is uh, very close to the fever clinic, or even inside the uh, fever clinic. We expanded the fever clinic space. We don't want to people with a fever when they come to see doctors not be so too crowded. It's easy for them to infect it, infection, uh, infect other, other persons. Next one, please. Uh, during the pandemic, we, uh, we limit the volume of our patient visits. We only keep the emergency and the fever clinic open, uh, but with a strict screen. Uh, we extended our online consultation and uh, pre prescription services. Even the insurance company, they, uh, they persuade, uh, they, they, they change their policy. They allow us to one time prescribe three months of medication for those patients with chronic disease, like the stable and genopatrys, uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, et cetera. Uh, among the one, two months, we provide a 70,000 domestic online consultation and the 7,000 overseas visits since the outbreak. Now, after the pandemic, now we reopen our service uh, according to the dynamics of the pandemic. Next one, please. Uh, about surgery, what is about the surgery? So during the pandemic, we suspend our elective surgeries. Uh, we only do uh, emergency surgery, like trauma, stroke, uh, or other acute surgeries, et cetera. Uh, a few semi-elective surgeries, like tumor, resection, et cetera. Uh, now the, our, all of the surgery services are uh, reopened, but uh, we emphasize a lot the COVID-19 surgery, especially before the uh, surgeries. Next one, please. Uh, to perform the, uh, if uh, we train the, if we want to do a surgery for some highly suspected or confirmed patients, uh, absolutely we want our surgeons, uh, we perform the surgery in active pressure operating room. Uh, we emphasize surgeons with the highest level of PPE. Next one, please. Uh, 
just uh, one month ago, we worked with the Alibaba. We, we, wrote, a, we wrote a book online. The name of the book is uh, Hospital Response Strategy. Uh, we translate it, uh, it in, with, uh, into 26 uh, languages. So it's a free check online, free reading online. So welcome all of, uh, all of people. If you are interested in how to do a property hospital management during the outbreak of pandemic, welcome to be on, to check it online. Uh, last one, please. Uh, uh, I think the most important now is uh, the whole world need to be united to fight against COVID-19. I'm sure we will win. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Our next speaker is Dr. Craig R. James, Director of School of Public Health and Health Systems, University of Waterloo. Please, Dr. James. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here and joining uh, really a, a, just a, a wonderful group. Um, I have my own slides, but you can use the ones you have if you like. Um, that's fine. Uh, so next slide, please. So in, in many cases, the uh, situation in Canada is not that much different from the situation in the United States. And the question that I was presented with was how is Canada performed in mounting an effective response to COVID-19 is in many ways, unfortunately, in, in some ways, uh, similar to that in the U.S. So I thought I would emphasize just a few of the things that makes Canada perhaps a little bit unique uh, in comparison. Um, this will be a 10,000 foot view. I'll go over some, uh, not in, into a whole lot of detail, uh, and then conclude with uh, drawing uh, some conclusions for how we might go forward and lessons for uh, other context. But first, let me give you a bit of a context here. Uh, our first case in Canada uh, was on January 15th. It's a traveler from Wuhan. Our first death was March 9th in Vancouver, BC. Uh, after March 9th, the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths increased sharply with the beginning of community spread uh, and, uh, and a real reluctance of our government to close borders really until it was a bit too late. Um, as of June 3rd, that's yesterday, we had about 93,000 confirmed cases, 7,344 deaths. And importantly, and then this is something I'll come back to, uh, almost 6,000 of those deaths are associated with uh, long-term care facilities. These are facilities uh, housing ma mainly uh, older people with uh, uh, complex uh, health needs, dementia, and so forth. Most of our cases uh, and deaths are in Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who don't have uh, Canadian geography firmly in mind, I thought I would put the same information up here on a map. Uh, the darker colors, of course, is where we are, where we have the most cases. Uh, that's uh, Quebec and Ontario, not particularly surprising since this is where the most of the population is, our largest cities, Montreal and Toronto. Uh, what is uh, surprising, perhaps, and I'll direct your attention to the fact that British Columbia, which is where Vancouver is located, has actually had relatively few cases, few deaths, and has actually performed quite quite well and is largely a testament to, I think, a very effective public health response and public health leader there. Next slide. Next slide. And it just a, a, a seven day moving average of cases to show how we stack up against other countries, quite similar, as I mentioned, to the UK, uh, the US and so forth, but you certainly see a flattening of the curve, which is encouraging. Next slide. So in terms of our response, um, the slide is, oh, there we go. So after some initial reluctance, um, the federal government implemented travel restrictions beginning March 16th uh, from all countries except for the U.S. And then uh, beginning on March 21st, it, it closed the borders to all but non-essential uh, travelers from the U.S. And this is going to remain in effect for another couple weeks. In my view, they'll probably extend this. It really depends a lot on, on what's happening in the U.S. and the, the perceived risk of travel from the U.S. to Canada in terms of seeding further outbreaks. Emergency lockdown measures were implemented uh, federally in mid-March. Um, this included all of the measures that uh, we've seen reported by the other uh, presentations, you know, school closures, uh, closing of all non-essential businesses, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. Provinces and territories are just now starting to, 
moving to reopen, but there's a huge amount of variability. Uh, Quebec actually opened their schools a couple weeks ago, even despite having relatively uh, large numbers of cases and not a real sign that things were improving. BC opened their schools last, uh, last week. Uh, Ontario has been uh, much more cautious and uh, we're still all working at home. Next slide. So how do I as assess or how do I assess Canada's response? So the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, SARS really shook Canada up. Uh, Toronto was one of the hard hit cities during the SARS epidemic. Um, and uh, what you saw was uh, a real re-examination of public health in Canada. Uh, and it really demonstrated that the public health system in Canada had really fallen apart. Uh, and we really stumbled badly in trying to handle SARS, particularly in Ontario. So a number of uh, studies were commissioned. A major report uh, came out uh, recommending significant legislative changes. This led to the creation of the Public Health Agency of Canada and the equipping of the Public Health Agency of Canada with some uh, policy, uh, policy uh, tools really to try and coordinate across what is really a, a variable patchwork of provincial, territorial, and local municipal public health jurisdictions. This has not really been fully successful. Um, there was uh, early successes, I think. Uh, I think the response to H1N1, which occurred just a couple years after SARS, uh, really showed that uh, a, a coordinated response uh, was quite effective. Um, but unfortunately, PHAC, or the Public Health Agency of Canada, has really not been able to, su su to sustain its position um, to the extent that I think that we would all like it to as, a, uh, as, a, as the Canada's leader of public health action. Part of the reason here is that Canada's brand of federalism consigns responsibility for health to the provinces and territories. So public health is integrated in different ways in the different provinces. In some cases, it's part of the healthcare system or part of the health system. Uh, other provinces, such as Ontario, it's actually separate. Um, in any case, it just makes coordination and collaboration really quite complicated and difficult. Public Health Agency of Canada probably was never equipped with all of the policy instruments that it could have used, such as fiscal instruments and so forth, um, such as what the CDC uses um, to, uh, I think, encourage uh, states and localities uh, to uh, pursue programs in particular directions, particular ways. So the provincial capacities for disease surveillance and control vary enormously, and this is really uh, troublesome in some cases. And there have been a lot of concerns about data gathering, sharing outmoded data systems, reports that uh, some hospitals have lost uh, tests. They we were relying on faxes rather than digital entry of, of case reports and so forth. So some, some, some really cracks that have appeared in the system. And a lot of this is due to essentially budget cut after budget cut. As many of us know in public health, public health often suffers uh, in comparison to, to health care particularly if there isn't an emergency on the horizon. Next slide. So the consequences for the COVID response, uh, given this, this kind of fragmented system we have, are predictable. So we have very poor testing capacity, very similar to the US. Um, finally, I think it was just last week, we can now um, uh, actually have testing uh, if you're asymptomatic and if you've had contact or you suspect you've had contact uh, with a symptomatic case. This is brand new. We really weren't able to do anything but uh, uh, symptomatic testing uh, up until just a couple of weeks ago, and, and very similar to the U.S. setting. Uh, that means we just simply don't know what's going on in our community. We have little glimpses here and there of certain vulnerable populations, certain high-risk populations, but we really don't know what's going on in the community, and that really impairs uh, an effective public health response. But there have been some positives. Uh, we've seen pretty good public health leadership in terms of public health communication at the federal and provincial levels. Uh, policymakers and politicians have largely taken a back seat and deferred to this leadership, uh, which in comparison to the U.S. context is, is really quite notable uh, and refreshing. And it's a good lesson, I think, uh, for other contexts as well. We have some public health rock stars, even uh, Teresa Tam, who is our uh, chief public health officer for Canada, uh, Bonnie Henry is the Chief Public Health Officer for the province of British Columbia, uh, are really well known. You can even get t-shirts with 
their images on on them now. So really quite a, quite a significant difference from the U.S. in this context, a real honoring of the public health uh, workforce. And certainly we've seen a much greater emphasis on research. And, and PHAC did, one thing I will say that they have done uh, is really helped build a larger, more qualified public health workforce. And this really has helped in this fragmented uh, system that we now have. Next slide, please. Um, the one major concern, though, that I do want to mention, uh, and just to pick up the thread that I mentioned at the very beginning, is that COVID-19 has revealed very significant problems with the long-term care system in Canada. Long-term care was never included in the Canada Health Act, which is our major single-payer insurance system. And so long-term care has been consigned to this melange, complicated network of private providers, some for-profit, some not-for-profit. And in these different settings, there are a number of problems that have emerged, insufficient staffing, uh, part-time staff because employers don't want to pay benefits, so they're only allowing staff to work part-time. So staff are moving from facility to facility uh, and so forth, lack of quality standards. And of course, all this comes down to really a uh, lack of effective regulation. It's important to note though, a couple things here. First is that it's really only a small number of homes that account for most of the cases. Most have actually done a reasonably good job under very difficult circumstances. And you might think that for-profit homes might be more responsible for some of the cases given the tendency to cut costs and so forth. Uh, but this has not been uh, the case. It's more having more to do with the age of the home, crowding issues and so forth. Um, but it's, it's really uh, been a, a, a real wake up call for Canada and a real shameful thing. Our, our uh, prime minister actually had to call in the Canadian military to take over staffing of some of our long-term care facilities. A lot of very horrible images coming out of this, and it'll be something that we'll be reckoning with for some time. Next slide. So as we move forward into the post-pandemic era, and, and I think these uh, are some of the lessons that we'll learn and are lessons for other contexts as well, we really need to carefully examine this complex federalism that Canada has um, and to ask questions whether uh, or how we, we uh, uh, address an emergency situation like a pandemic with a strong federal response and get the provinces and the local uh, uh, municipal public health authorities to kind of fall in line uh, and speak with one voice uh, and act in one way, which I think has not really happened to the degree that it probably should have. We clearly need uh, more attention, as I mentioned, the long-term care uh, uh, system. And, uh, and I think that what we'll see, of course, is, is a really careful rethink um, of the whole emergency system in this federal system uh, that we have. And I think for other federal systems, such as the US, um, Australia, uh, Germany, and so forth, uh, this is probably a lesson that they will also learn uh, from this uh, pandemic. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. James. Our next speaker is Dr. Chi Man Winnie Yip, Professor and Director of China Health Partnership, T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Harvard University. Please, Dr. Yip. Hey, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be speaking among a panel of esteemed leaders of public health schools. Um, so um, can I have my first slide? <clears throat> uh, I have uh, titled my talk as Revisioning Our Healthcare Systems. Um, my view is that um, the, um, how we are able to respond to any future epidemic will very much depend on whether we have a strong healthcare system. And I'm only able to do some reflections tonight because in my view, we are still in the midst of the pandemic. We haven't really come out of it yet. But nonetheless, there are already some good observations that we can draw from. And it's a good opportunity for us to think about how we might take this opportunity to build a healthcare system that for each of our country, that would be more apt for the future. Um, next slide, please. So I have drawn six reflections, um, largely uh, based on my observations and my work in China, even though I live in the US, um, but also drawing some um, contrast to the US. 
and, and also now listening from Canada and Singapore as well. Um, looking into the future, I think there will be another um, virus that is new. And what is so challenging about COVID-19 is that in the very beginning, it is a new virus, meaning that there were lots of unknowns. And um, you don't need to pay attention to the detail of this graph. It's just taken from a published paper. But this is just a representative of any epidemic curve. And so what we would like in the future is to prevent another Wuhan, to prevent another New York City, meaning that we would like to prevent the increase in the number of cases to grow at an exponential rate. Because once you get to that part of the curve, it becomes very difficult to control. And you would have to use very um, drastic strategies like lockdown, like um, closing your border. And those are effective strategy, but definitely they have huge economic, social, and psychological impact. So I think it would be important for us to think about what should we put in place such that in the future, when we have a new virus, while the science is still working out the characteristics of the, of the virus, what are some of the things that one can do to prevent the spread of the virus? And so a number of you have already alluded to early reporting, early detection, and early isolation. And in fact, if you look at a number of other countries, why we do not know the perfect science of the or the characteristics of the virus, the system that have been more effective in controlling and containing it tend to be system that is doing a lot of community-based detection, quarantine, and also um, isolation. Now, China actually has developed a very um, high-tech reporting system since SARS so that any suspicious cases will be um, reported through an electronic system in real time from any hospital or any community health centers all the way to CDC and to the Department of Health from the local level and to the top. And so, but in addition to reporting, what else do we need to put in such that in the future, when we have a new virus, we would know how to um, reduce the consequences of it. So again, if it is something that we know already, we have the test, we already know um, what is the, how infectious it is, whether it is human to human or animal to human, whether it is asymptomatic, that's a different set of strategy. But I think we will be coming across another situation of which there will be a period of time we actually don't know much about the characteristics of that virus. What should we be doing in order to prevent um, the growth of the virus in, uh, in, uh, in an exponential rate? Next slide, please. The second reflection I have is that I think that COVID-19 has exposed certain weaknesses in the delivery system in China, and I would say in the United States as well. In both countries, the delivery system is rather hospital-centric with a relatively weak primary health care system in the sense that primary health care in the sense, a, a weak primary health care in the sense of competency, but also in a sense of trust by the people. A strong primary health care system actually could do a lot of things. In particular, a number of the strategies many of you have already referred to, like contact tracing, um, case identification, public education, monitoring, quarantine. But I would say that in this crisis, we see that primary health care has played limited role. And in the future, it would be important for systems to have a resource allocation. What I show in here is the resource allocation in China um, by hospital and by primary care. Ideally, one would see it to be slightly not even not completely inverted, but have a much stronger base so that it has a stronger foundation to work with. Uh, next slide, please. My next reflection is, we're paying a lot of attention to COVID-19, 
but definitely there are huge consequences on non-COVID-19 patients. How should we be reimagining a healthcare system that can buffer against the negative consequences for the non-COVID-19 patients? We already know that the huge impact on immunization, delayed diagnosis, delayed care and treatment. Um, I have been doing some analysis um, with Chinese colleagues using national data to look at acute ischemic stroke and found that during January, March, uh, uh, February and March, the number of stroke emission compared to the previous year around the same time is a reduction of 50%. It's a huge number. So those who are severe would still be admitted, but for stroke patients, a lot of the not very severe patients, if they're not admitted in time, the consequences is huge as well. And in lower middle income countries, we're already seeing reports that TB treatment, maternal and child health, nutrition program, program have all been severely affected. So those are, those are, uh, uh, important part of the population that we should not lose sight on. What I have on this graph is um, just um, some data um, that are presented uh, by the Commonwealth Fund to show in the United States the reduction in the number of visits. And this is data from a particular set of health plan. And you see that compared to a baseline at the peak, the number of outpatient visits actually fall by about 60% of that, which is huge. Next slide, please. And now get me to the next point. I think that when we reimagine the future healthcare system, technology has to be a core part of it. There's no question that telemedicine is playing a significant part in the US, in many parts of the country, and definitely in China. Um, I've seen some of the data to show that the number, increased number of telemedicine, and uh, Dr. Wang already showed some of that from his hospital, but if you take a more national level, it is increasing by more than 10, if not 20, 30,000 uh, uh, times of it. And I think that telemedicine probably would become the new normal. So the question is, how do we use telemedicine in a way that actually can fill the gap of a weak primary healthcare system and also to develop standards so that we are sure that the care that is developed on the platform are actually up to par. And so also, we also should spend time to think about what are the proper rules and regulation on the use of data and privacy whether it is for telemedicine or whether it is for using technology for monitoring, for contact tracing, for identifying high-risk population. The graph I show here is just an indication again on the increase in telemedicine in the United States while the offline visits were falling. Again, I'm looking at some of the data in China. The increase in telemedicine has been huge during the lockdown period. However, it is far from compensating for the reduction in, off, in on, uh, offline visits. So there is a question on how much compromise we are making in terms of access to care for the non-COVID patients. The next slide, please. The next slide is, um, I think my colleagues in the United States know very much about the importance of having universal insurance coverage. And I think that China has universal insurance coverage, Canada has, and it really shows the huge importance of that in terms of providing affordable care, but also significantly on equality. In the US, the poor, the uninsured, are much worse affected. And it is partly due to insurance coverage because insurance coverage is very much tied to the jobs. And today when so many people have lost their job, they also lose their insurance coverage. And some systems actually, when they have universal insurance coverage, they also have a unified database. And I have seen some systems that innovatively tie that database to 
immigration travel data so that you immediately know when a patient show up that what has been their travel history, have they been exposed to certain risk? And, um, and, and so that's the additional benefit of having um, universal insurance coverage. My last point, this next slide please. My last point is that any healthcare system, if it runs, we also need to think about the governance structure. And it is particularly important for large countries like China, like the United States, and also just now we heard about Canada. The relationship between central to local and each level of the local and the relationship between public health system, which is primarily delineated by the CDC, and the medical care system, and the government decision, a government decision maker who actually can make decisions, it is all very complicated and fragmented. So despite the best intention, because of the lack of clarity and fragmentation in decision making, very often the implementation has created a lot of bottleneck so that decisions might be delayed implementation of the decisions might be further delayed. And um, I'm not going to go into detail to explain the Chinese system, which at this point is actually under heated debate. What should the CDC system be? How much more decision power should they be given? Which level of the decision should they be given? Um, but I think this is something that all countries, if it is a large country, especially with an with a complicated central to local relation needs to look at this more carefully. So I'll conclude, so I'm just uh, throwing out a few reflections for all of you to um, discuss, to, um, for us to imagine what the future might look like that would make us better prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yip. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for the panel discussion. Dr. Vivian Ho, James A. Baker III, Institute Chair in Health Economics, Rice University. Please go ahead, Dr. Ho. Thank you, Ms. Sun. I'd like to be respectful of everybody's time um, uh, because I, I know we're going over time now. Th these were excellent presentations, um, quite informative, and, and maybe um, Ms. Sun and Dr. Wu, you, you want to organize a follow-up um, webinar at some point where it's more, more discussion-based. So I'm only just going to ask one question. I'm going to ask um, two of the speakers this question. I'm going to uh, be asking Dr. Goldman and, and Dr. Wong. And the question is, how well does the public understand the need for COVID-19 prevention and control in your country? And do you have any recommendations for public education? Uh, Dr. Goldman, you had mentioned um, that people in the Austin, Texas movie theater um, didn't want to wear a mask. Do you think most Americans are like that? Or, or is there some heterogeneity? Actually, I do not think most Americans are like that. I, I have to say that through this, I have been amazed given the lack of clear communications often coming from the top down that most people, it seems to me, have understood what they need to do. That people have been amazingly cooperative about staying at home. They have understood that they need to have distancing and I even see many people wearing masks but we do see outbreaks of people not doing it. And we do see people who willfully have been rebellious about it. And that has been a problem because of the fact that not so much that, that I don't think most of our people can, I think most of our people can understand, but I think the lack and of, of clear and consistent governance, and I think Dr. Yip's talk was very important in this regard, that you know, I, right now I'm happy that we have very independent states, to be honest. I'm, I'm happy that we have a federal system because our federal government was not providing the leadership that we needed and many governors did, but not all of them are. And some of them have not been consistent in, their, in how they have been dealing with the COVID-19 and that has affected what's going on in populations like in some of the parts of our country where I think they have opened too early and the citizenry, they haven't seen much COVID so they don't believe that it's a problem. But where I am, people are being very careful 
And uh, I, I have a feeling that's probably two in Massachusetts uh, where, where Winnie is, and it's in two in Connecticut as well. Um, so, it, you know, what, what, what we would hope for, but we don't have, is leadership that would be honest, would be truthful. And so, for example, many times we've been told everyone can get a test when it's not true. We have been told that the vaccine is around the corner. It's been overly optimistic about how soon we will have a vaccine. And these things have created fissures in our society where people who choose to believe those things, it has empowered them to feel, well, maybe I don't need to, to use a mask. But I don't blame the people for that. Um, Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Goldman. Dr. Wang, I wanted to ask you the same question because you've been on the front lines and you've interacted with many Chinese patients. Okay, thank you for your good, very good questions. Uh, in China, uh, the population, the people understand the government policy quite well. Now, I think that most of the public, they are so co cooperative following the uh, government policy. Uh, in China, uh, as you know, the the local government is following the central government quite tightly. So the, the policy is quite uniform in the whole, in the whole China. Um, <clears throat> so due to the global pandemic is still raging and also the presence of asymptomatic patients, uh, my recommendation would be the uh, first is still the face mask looks so important, especially in a confined space or a high risk place, like taking public transportation, taking the elevators, uh, going to the hospital or the cinema, like this kind of uh, place. Uh, the second one is to keep social distancing and hand hygiene. Uh, third one is self-isolation and have tests when you are having symptoms. Uh, the fourth is to avoid, avoid a bigger gathering uh, fifth is uh, utilization of telecommunication as many as possible. Uh, the last one I suggest is still a staggered work or meal time. So uh, this is my, uh, my idea and my comments about the question. Dr. Ho, Dr. Ho yes. I just received a request for us to continue. I know the audience will really enjoy the panel discussion. Please continue. Thank you. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much then. Um, so so the, the next question I'd like to ask is, what type of popula population level studies are researchers conducting to assess the health, social, or economic impacts of COVID-19? Or what studies should we be con conducting? Um, Dr. Yip, would you like to um, talk about this? We need to... Un unmute Dr. Yip first. I'm going to be asking this question to Dr. Yip, Dr. Tu, and, 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 um, and Dr. Okay, here, go okay, ahead. Thank you. Um, I think that lots of studies that need to be done, uh, but as I said, because we're still in the midst of it, um, I think some of the study is still very preliminary. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of economists that are already looking at what is the impact of COVID-19 on the broader macro economy. And I think this is a different time compared to SARS, let's say, it's because of the global connectedness and the global dependency. It's just hugely, hugely increased. Anything that happens in one country would have a domino effect that goes on. So um, I understand that there are a lot of work that is going on that try to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the macroeconomic condition for a country, but also globally, taking into account supply chain, travel, um, et cetera. Um, there are also lots of studies that is trying to look at the impact of unemployment, which is hugely um, important in every part of the uh, world that are severely affected by COVID-19. Um, among these kind of work, there's also a lot of attention paid to the distributional effect because the lower income individuals and people working in certain profession are definitely more adversely hurt than the more wealthy population. Um, another type of study that I'm aware of 
is actually just um, even looking at the impact of COVID on the healthcare industry itself, on the pharmaceutical industry, um, but at the same time on the hospitals themselves. And we know what is happening in the US. Um, there's also another group of work that I know that is going on is looking at precisely mental health because COVID-19 really has caused a lot of different kinds of mental health problems for different sites of population. And that also include children because of staying at home and studying. How does it affect the development long-term and the cognition as well? So I just stop here. So huge amount of interesting things going on. Thank you. And Dr. Tu? Well, Dr. Yip has given such a comprehensive overview that the few points <laughs> that we have actually have been already addressed by Dr. Yip. But I think I would just mention one additional point, which is uh, the social science aspect cannot be ignored as well. Uh, so, because a lot of the measures that countries have taken, and I would like to highlight that many of the measures that we hear about are amplified by international press. And the international press has been very much focused on developed nations in North America, in Europe, in Asia. But what has happened is that things that we take for granted, like for example, work from home, home-based schooling for children, a lot of this require technology, equipment that many in the society that are not as developed do struggle with. And I think that the social science aspect, particularly looking at inequities within a community, as well as inequities that are present across countries, are very important as well. So looking at how things that we assume that general households, communities will be able to adopt with this lockdown, this restriction on movement, restriction on goods and services, those are the studies that we really need to, to put in place to understand how is the community in a country affected differentially because of uh, whether it is social economic status, whether it is other education attainment and other factors. But I, I think I will stop at that because I think Dr. Yip has given a very comprehensive uh, overview of what are the population studies that will be required to really understand the impact of COVID-19 in the country. Over back to you, Vivian. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tu. Um, so, so this question I'd just like to ask to Dr. Vermund and Dr. Wu. Um, how has the pandemic affected care of non-COVID patients in your country? Um, uh, Dr. Yip talk, talked about that. Um, I'd like to, to hear um, your perspectives. Have you seen a growth in telemedicine or other digital solutions? Um, Dr. Vermund, given that you're at Yale, you, you should have uh, seen some of the, the latest latest and greatest in this? Absolutely correct. Um, when the hospitals in our state shut down their elective surgeries and also started postponing routine health visits, there was a large uh, population, uh, and as Dr. Yip, uh, Yip pointed out, this is uh, generalizable to the United States as a whole, there was a large population of persons needing care who didn't get it. And we still don't know what the public health impact of this um, delayed care is going to be. Um, we do have anecdotes uh, and we do have some case reports. Um, for example, uh, cardiologists have noticed that uh, cases of um, cardiovascular abnormalities, particularly heart attacks, have reached the ER at a later date, a later time compared to pre-COVID, implying that patients waited for a longer time. They were more reluctant to come into the hospital. So there will be a sad story to tell about the burden of um, non-COVID disease that surged along with COVID due to um, absence of um, um, healthcare availability, and not necessarily due to not having insurance, but reluctance uh, uh, either of the hospital to provide the care or the patient to go to the hospital. So that is um, uh, already being unearthed. One of our investigators, Dan Weinberger, um, 
is uh, working with the Washington Post and has done a series now in the Washington Post of analyses of this excess mortality um, that is attributable partly to undiagnosed COVID, but COVID's pretty easy to diagnose, so it's not missed that often, um, in, in, you know, especially for, uh, in terms of mortality, cause of mortality, but then all the excess beyond COVID. So I think that we will have, um, uh, uh, we'll be learning more and more, and it'll be interesting to compare and contrast the different countries around the world. I was very happy uh, that my friend uh, Yik Ying said uh, that the um, journalists are somewhat preoccupied with higher income countries, which is absolutely true. And uh, much less investigative journalism is going on as to what's happening in um, lower income nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I would point out uh, that the surge in Latin America has been very recent, and you're seeing countries now being represented with very high numbers, and we just don't know the whole story in those countries. Dr. Wu? Yeah. I think the pandemic has absolutely affected the care of the non-COVID uh, COVID patients, especially during the peak time of the uh, epidemic in China. As Dr. Wang mentioned, to prevent the cost of infection and to keep the limited resource for COVID-19 patients, hospitals suspended elective surgeries and aerosol generating procedures like dental clinics. And moreover, hospitals opened a free online consultation and provide e-prescription for patients. For example, like diabetes patients, they are able to have their online follow-up visit and the prescription, and also receive their medication even through the delivered, uh, like delivered by local pharmacy. And uh, also we can see that the telemedicine is well received and uh, by the public, and also is growing very fast. Thank you. Thank you. One last question to Dr. Jaynes. Um, so, so we know in the U.S. Um, the pandemic has led to all sorts of problems in terms of um, weaknesses in the U.S. system in terms of financing and delivery of health care. Millions of people lost their jobs. They lost their health insurance. Um, so Americans then look at Canada and think, well, universal health care would be a better, um, better option. Do you see the pandemic, though, um, uh, sort of shedding any light on weaknesses in the Canadian health care system? Well, you know, I, I, I do think that uh, you're correct in, in pointing out that with the, the universal health care system, certainly the uh, any of the care for COVID and, and related conditions are certainly covered. That was and, and, and the kind of factors that would make people reluctant to go to a doctor or hospital just in terms of finances are not there. Um, so in terms of, you know, your basic day-to-day uh, -day sort of health care plus COVID, Care. We never saw the, the excessive capacity in hospitals and so forth. Um, you know, there, there certainly wasn't a barrier there to people getting care. So the, the, the equitable provision of care was certainly a really strength of the Canadian system. It's certainly been demonstrated in the pandemic. I mean, the one area that I pointed out in my presentation, which is not really part of the universal care system, is the long-term care setting. And that's where I think we've really seen problems. And I think the COVID has really illustrated for us uh, the need to rethink how we uh, provide care for some of these vulnerable populations. Thank you very much. With that, I'd like to hand it um, back to Dr. Wu for some closing remarks. Okay. Dear friends and colleagues, first of all, I would like to say thanks again for our respectful speakers for their wonderful presentation and the fruitful discussion. And also, I would like to say thanks to our audience for your attendance. And we face a common destiny during a crisis like the unfortunate global pandemic of COVID-19 more than ever. Hence, we must gather wisdom and form a unit and form a unity. 
not only as public health experts, but as mankind to fight the outbreak with intensified efforts in great synergy. With this webinar, we shared our experience and lessons from our responses to the pandemic without any reservation. And more importantly, we showed our determination to turn this crisis into an opportunity and in fostering international collaboration and forging a stronger public health system for the global community. And in the end, despite all our differences, we are one human race with a common future. And we hope all of you are staying safe, healthy, and strong. And now we conclude the webinar. And thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you.